Coast of the Crimea is like a is like um, uh, the rungs of a ladder running in shore from the Crimea. You've got a, a series of rivers. The Bilbek, well, the Bulganek, and the Alma are the first three rivers which are going to be covered as the British approach. The Belbek, um, nothing really very much happens. The Bulganek, again, there is a small skirmish there. But on the 19th of September, so landed on the 14th, on the 19th of September, so the British bed down for the night immediately opposite what are called the heights of the Alma. Now, if you've not been there, you can well be forgiven for thinking that you've got a river in front of you and then enormous mountains on the other side. So on the, on the south side leading towards Sevastopol. That's really not the case. First time I went there, I say I was expecting to see a, a mountainous escalade. The, the pictures that we have of the Alma suggest to us that, that, that there was some sort of mountain assault. Well, that's not the case. The heights of the Alma are no more than about 300 foot in height on the south side of the river Alma. In other words, a gentle sort of bowl that reaches from the north side, where the British are looking down and the French are looking down towards the river, and then up onto the other side, the heights where the Russians have dug in. The Russian defences on the south side of the river are, there's a, a central road that runs through the position over a small bridge, and then the so-called Great Redoubt, and the Great Redoubt is an 18-gun battery which is directly opposite where the British will develop their attack. And then a lesser redoubt um, further inland, which will support the Great Redoubt uh, to try and enfilade anybody that's attacking the Great Redoubt. The night before, the British regiments arrive and they bed down. Now, I'd like to try and introduce you to the gentleman whose uniform we have behind us. Now, the battle winning equipment that I haven't mentioned so far is the British Minier rifle. The Americans will call it a mini. We, we refer to it as Minier because it's a, a French weapon. <coughs> I haven't got one to show you. They're extremely rare um, uh, uh, because they, they weren't in service for very long. But at a distance, the Minier looks like a musket. In other words, it loads from the muzzle and it, uh, at a distance, it's a percussion cap weapon. Uh, at a distance, you'd say, yep, it's a musket, until you realize that it's actually got an iron sight on it and that it's firing a lead bullet, not a ball, but a bullet, which is just too small for the rifling of the barrel, can be rammed down to the bottom of the barrel. When it fires, the lead expands, engages in the rifling, and the ball, the bullet, instead of flying about 400 paces, will now, now fly probably 2,000 paces. So as opposed to the sort of thing that, uh, that, that Wellington would have had at Waterloo, so a smoothbore brown best musket, the British soldier has suddenly got a rifle. And he's capable with this rifle of actually out shooting the Russian artillery. So his range is greater with a rifle than it is than the Russian guns, which he's gonna be facing on the next day. The only trouble is he doesn't know it. The weapon's only just been issued. It's issued when, when, when the, the army touches down in what is now Turkey. Well, it was Turkey, then Scutari in, in Istanbul. Um, and they've tried, they've become more familiar and more capable with these weapons, but they still don't realize exactly how powerful this weapon is. The troops for the first time, so the non-rifle regiments for the first time have got a rifle and they've got to look after the weapon and make sure that, for instance, you cannot, um, I'll give you an example, with a, with a musket, you can take shot and, and load shot into a musket and use it as a shotgun in order to shoot rabbits or hares or you know, whatever you need actually on the field of battle. You can't do this with a rifle at all. It's much more precious, much more, you've got to look after the thing properly. Dawn breaks the next day. These silly discussions that we've had, we've talked about. And I, I think the, the whole campaign is summed up for me by a man called Colour Sergeant McGuckin, Colour Sergeant McGuckin, who is the Colour Sergeant of the Grenadier Company. 
And he puts, he writes in his diary, he says, well, we're going into battle today. He's, he's a lowland Scot, and therefore I assume he's a Presbyterian. He says, I'm a Christian, I'm a Protestant, and I'm going into battle to fight other Christians. They may not quite be Protestants, but I sort of, you know, can sort of understand what the Russians are up to. In order to support Muslims, namely the Turks, and my allies are going to be Catholic Frenchmen. I don't get this. I just don't understand this. I'm much, much, much happier shooting and bayoneting Turks and Frenchmen than I will be Russians. And they are. You're a soldier and you do what you're told. And at dawn the next day, <clears throat> the British Army rows. Not very efficiently, I have to say, not, not particularly effectively. They have a heavy dew overnight. The boys uh, who've been, there's been a touch of cholera amongst the other ranks as they uh, uh, as they, they approach the Russian positions. There's quite a lot of people who, who aren't, aren't fully up to snuff, but the nobody, nobody falls out of the ranks. One or two men, it's true, have died during the night because, you know, this is 1854 after all. But apart from that, they're eager for the fight. There's quite a lot of boogering about inside the British organisation, whilst the French, the French are next to the coast, so they are to the British right, and therefore, on the coast, you've got the, the British and the French fleets who are sailing just off the coast. And with them, of course, the French, therefore, their right flanks are on the sea and therefore secured by the fleet. And the British are on their left flank, left flank, clearly secure as well. The British, on the other hand, the right flank is secured by the French, but the left flank, in other words, the Russians' right flank, is in the air. Nobody knows what is going to happen on the, on the British left, the Russian right. There are only five regiments of light cavalry ashore at the moment. They are the famous light cavalry brigade, 17th Lancers, 13th Light Dragoons, 4th Hussars, 8th Hussars, 11th Hussars. Um, they are, they're available, but, but, but uh, Lord Raglan, the British commander-in-chief, there's no French cavalry at all ashore. Lord Raglan, the commander-in-chief, is very, very, very reluctant. To, 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 risk, to risk his cavalry. The British have foot artillery and horse artillery working with them. Six pounders and nine pound guns. So these are, it's not correct to call them cannon, but we'll call them cannon for the, for, for the layman's point of view. These guns are capable of firing a series of different types of munition. First of all, they can fire round shot, sometimes called cannonball, but not by anybody that knows what they're talking about. Captain Pugwash would call it a cannonball. We call it a round shot. So we've got round shot being fired. Common shell. The artillery are capable of firing round shot. They're capable of firing common shell, which will produce fragments. And they're very capable of firing shrapnel, as well as very close quarters. They can fire canister. Canister is, is like a large shotgun. Which will, which will wreak all sorts of damage, all sorts of damage in any organization that is that, that gets in the way of the gun up to about 600 paces. Now, all of these styles of ammunition I've talked about, they are replicated 100% by the Russians who have got exactly the same style of munition, but the Russians are firing from a pre-prepared defensive position on the south side of the Alma. Now, um, I, if Richard Beebe, who is a gunner, he would tell us if he could speak, and mercifully he can't, Richard, um, uh, he would tell us exactly what an advantage being in a defensive position rather than an attacking position it is for a gunner. So the French and the British artillery will be effective, but they will be nothing like as effective as the Russian guns which are dug in. So the, the, the troops fall in, it takes them two or three hours to get themselves properly organized. And as they move, move down the slope, there is an O group. There's a, there's, a, there's a conference between the French and the British commanders, saint being the Frenchman, and Lord Raglan being the Brit, where it's decided that the French will move first on the right and the British will hang back on the left. The French will endeavour to cross the River Alma, obviously at the bottom of this shallow valley, and to ascend the steep ground 
to the south of the river, next to the city, with a view to turning Menshikov's flank. Once the flank is turned, then it'll be the British, it'll be up to the British to do something, something. It's not clear exactly what the British are going to do. All we know is that the French are going to start the ball rolling, and should they be successful in turning the flank, then the British can be deployed. And then the regiment unfurls the colours. The colours are done up in a great sort of leather case affair at the moment, so it looks like a big firework. Take the case off, and the colours are unfurled. And then about 400 yards north of the Alma, the regiment, along with all the other regiments of De Lacey Evans's second division, they troop the colours. They troop the colours in front of the Russians, who are probably now about a thousand paces away in total on the other side of the river. Why? Well, you've all seen the trooping of the colour on, on, on Horse Guards Parade. It's exactly the same operation. They're showing the troops exactly what the colours look like and how they will, where to, where to rally when the firing starts and to know exactly where the commanding officer is and where the junior and the senior major are, in other words, the command element of the battalion. Now they're looking across the valley and across the valley, they can see, they can see the sun flashing off the brass of these helmets and twinkling off the fixed bayonets of the Russian infantry, which at a distance, they, they, they look like some sort of standing crop they're not a standing crop at all. They're great bunches of infantry, which are standing there waiting for them to come across the river and to try their luck with the Russian guns on the other side. The infantry advances. The Russians therefore decide that they're going to try a little bit of, uh, a little bit of um, ranging uh, from their guns. And their 32 pound howitzers in the Great Redoubt, they open fire right into the center of the British line. Now, probably the range is something like 1,200 paces. So they're, they're at extreme combat range. The rounds that they're firing are round shot. Now, why would they fire round shot? Well, you start off when you're engaging your opponent with uh, in 19th century artillery with round shot in order to warm the barrels. So the, the, the barrels, which in this case are gunmetal from the German, from the, sorry, from the Russian houses, <coughs> they need to expand with the heat of the round and then be, be, be become more accurate once they've fired one or two rounds. The rounds, for the most part, do no damage. Some officers of the 47th or Lancashire Regiment have got their dogs with them. They've, one or two officers have greyhounds with them. And as the rounds bounce down, towards the British, right at, the, say, right at the extreme range, the 47th dogs turn and chase the rounds, um, barking, barking violently. Nobody's hurt at first. One man from the 41st or Welsh regiment, he decides that he's going to try and kick one of these rounds because it, you know, they're harmless enough. They look like a football, don't they? Well, he gets up in front of in front of the rest of the army who are out now, you know, left and right, spread out in, in line in line of rest. Goes up. He's clearly a clearly a capable man. His his hand to eye coordination is good, and he manages to engage the round. Unfortunately, it takes his foot off, and it becomes immediately clear, immediately clear that this is not a career enhancing move to start kicking a fast moving round. Over on the British right. The French attack is now developing. It's probably around about midday, maybe a little late by this day. saint the French commander, leads his men. Uh, the Bosquet is one of the divisional commanders. Prince Napoleon is one of the other divisional commanders. They cross the river next to the sea. In other words, they're heading north to south, the French right being against the sea under the cover of the British and French warships. The, um, the Yakutsk regiment, now, when I say a regiment, that's four battalions, so it's, it's a large brigade of the Russians. The Akutsk are guarding the Russian left, in other words, the seaside flank. They've been pulled back some little way because they don't want to come under fire from the British and the French fleets. This allows the French to sneak up right next to the sea, up onto the high ground, and to start carrying out a right flanking attack, exactly as the British and the French have done, the French commanders have decided before the action is engaged. Hard to know, but I should think for the next 40 minutes, maybe three quarters of an hour, 
The French, therefore, carry out a right flanking attack and they romp along the high ground just south of the Alma. The Alma is fordable uh, up by the, by the mouth of the Alma. Uh, they get across and led by the Zouaves and the Tirailleurs Algériens, in other words, they're, they're colonial troops who are very, very good and highly experienced. They roll the Russians up. The, 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 the Yakuts don't particularly like what they're, what they're seeing. They start to experience for the first time the minier fire of the French. They start to experience the French horse artillery, which is wheeled up by hand up onto the high ground down on the Russian left. And within about an hour, so something like one o'clock, something like that, maybe a little bit later, the French are doing exactly what has been designed to do and rolling the Russians up along the top of the cliff line. The position, the Alma position, is divided by the Sevastopol Road. The Sevastopol Road, self-eminently, leads from the Alma about 14 miles south, 14, 15 miles south, down to Sevastopol. Broadly, the French are on the sea side of the road, the British are on the inland side of the road. By the time that the French have carried out their right flanking attack and have moved themselves up to the seaside side of the road, the French suddenly shout, oh my God, by God, we, we are now exposed. We're now exposed. And they're exposed to the guns from the Great Redoubt, from the Russian main position, which are firing straight into their faces as they try to outflank the Russians. Napoleon's division, Count Robert's division, they stall. They stall. I mean, there's no, no better word for it. They don't lack a gallantry, but they're now under Russian gunfire. And this is not the rifle fire revolts, not the, not the musket fire, rather, of the Russians. It's actually the heavy artillery that the Russians are firing. And saint the, the the French commander, says to Lord Raglan, right, Lord Raglan, we have done our bit. It's now your turn. Well, the British are lined up. Uh, the left hand attacking, the left assault division is the light division, which consists of, of six regiments of infantry. And then the light division, immediately, immediate, sorry, the first division immediately behind them, which are guards and Highlanders. And the right assault division is De Lacey Evans's second division. On the right hand side, you've got the 41st, the 47th and the 49th the fighting 40s and the left attack brigade of the 7th Royal Fusiliers, 23rd Royal Welsh Fusiliers, and the 95th or the Derbyshire Regiment, who are attacking adjacent to the 30th, 30th Cambridgeshire and the 55th West Northern Regiment. Well, the Light Division receive orders to cross the river, and as they do so, they are aimed directly at the Great Redoubt, which lies a couple of hundred feet above them and probably half a mile of gunfire swept glassy or slope immediately to their front. Anthony Morgan, this gentleman just behind me here, his coat, he says that the regiment is made to stand. The colours, so a great six foot by six foot six yellow silk regimental colour and the great Union Jack or the, 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 or the, the, the Queen's colour are unfurled. And he then says, the, the, men are, the men are chaffing each other, they're ribbing each other, they're saying, look at the Frenchies, bloody hell, they're getting a good blinking hammering up there, ha <laughs> ha, is it fun? And then suddenly the order comes out, with ball cartridge, load, the whole regiment goes quiet. The cartridge is taken out of the pouch, the top is bitten off, the charge is poured into the barrel, the round is reversed, and it rounds home, the, the ramrod put back below the, in the furniture of the weapon. Weapon moved up, is capped. In other words, a, a percussion cap is put on the nipple. And uh, <coughs> suddenly Morgan and his pals are aware. This is no, this isn't joking anymore. This is, this is the real thing. We're going to have to face this one. First troops out are the skirmishers. Uh, they move out to the front and the first thing they face are Russian rifles. Now, this is not a musket. This is a rifle. Skirmishers for the light company move out to the front. 
And we now move to a man called Hector, uh, sorry, uh, uh, James McDonald. James McDonald. James McDonald is the McDonald of McDonald of Glencoe. He's the last of his particular line of Scottish lads. And being a good Scotsman, he has joined the Derbyshire Regiment, 95th the Derbyshire Regiment. Don't know why. Uh, he commands the light, uh, sorry, he's second in command of the light company, the skirmishing company. And as they move down towards the Alma, you can see just here, you see the, the big cross belt plate here. Well, he's wearing something very similar to that. That's that's Morgan's, it's not McDonald's, but, but it, as he's moving down through the bush with his skirmishes around him, he suddenly, he says, all my, all my senses are knocked from me. I'm conscious that I'm lying on the ground. I can't see, I can't hear, I can't speak. Everything has gone black. I conclude that I'm dead. I, I was rather hoping that I'd go to heaven at this stage, but no, that, that, that's just not what it appears to be. But Donald, actually, as it, as it will transpire, has been hit by a Russian rifle bullet from the weapon I've just shown you, this thing. He's been hit by a Russian rifle bullet just there on the big buckle of his crossbow plane. He's not back. He's lying on, on the ground. Two soldiers come up to him and will stand over and say, bloody hell, sir. What's, what's wrong with you? And he said, there's nothing wrong with me at all, except that I'm dead. I said, well, you, you're not dead. You're speaking. He said, well, I can't see. I can't hear. And they pick him up. They physically grab him under the armpits and, 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 and pull him upright. And he suddenly realizes he's not dead. He's not dead at all. The, the, the eyesight starts to come back. He says he's bleeding from his nose. Well, OK, well, we've all had nosebleeds. And as, as he's being stood up and fussed with by, by his two soldiers, so Colonel Webber Smith, the commanding officer of the 95th, rides past on his horse and he says, MacDonald, what's wrong with you? And he shakes his head and says, well, I... I and he looks down, the commanding officer looks down, and he points this thing here. And it's got a bloody great Russian bullet sticking in it. A great thing like the, like the end of my thumb sticking in the plate. And the commanding officer says, but Donald, I'd sooner have that plate than a medal. Oh, thank you, sir. That's extremely reassuring. Thank you so much. Just what I wanted to hear. He pushes down with his skirmishers they, they they get themselves onto the right onto the bank of the river and as they're doing so the russian artillery from 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 the uh, from the redoubt while they're firing as hard as they possibly can they've changed from round shot now to common shot probably shrapnel as well and as the troops push into the river there's a bank on the south side which gives them a bit of cover so mcdonald uh, is behind his company commander who's an man called james eddington james eddington Terribly smart. He, he, he's by word for smartness inside the regiment. And Eddington, this a lovely thing to do is to is to command is to command this company. And he said, "Come on, boys! Come on! Come on! Get out of the river! Don't be scared! Don't be scared!" He pushes up the bank, and as he raises his head, his head disappears. A, a, a red mist of of brains and matter and whatever. His head is taken off from his shoulders. Not not terribly reassuring, as you can appreciate. Uh, for the troops that are that are coming behind. Morgan is back with the Grenadier Company, so the right-hand company of the 95th Regiment. He says, over to his right, over to his right, the village has caught fire, the village of Bouliok, which is on the north side of the river. Undoubtedly, the Russians have prepared this with straw and tar and other bits and pieces uh, to catch fire, and the smoke is drifting heavily now across the British as they're trying to get across the river. Morgan says, well, thank God for that. Actually, that's what we want. We want a bit of smoke to cover us across the river. But the Russians have got the whole thing organized as they get into the river. So they change from common shell to shrapnel. And the troops, as they're trying to get across, are met now by rounds which are bursting 20, 30 feet above them as they're trying to force their way across the river. Lacey Ye, Y-E-A, who for reasons best known to himself, pronounces his name, name as Yor. They see Yor, who's commanding the 7th or Royal Fusiliers. He, he's an absolute martinet. He keeps his regiment in good fighting trim, and he's heard to shout, come on, 7th, come on, get across, anyhow, anyhow. And you can imagine this press of men, Royal Welsh Fusiliers, 
Royal Fusiliers, 19th or Green Howards, 95th or Derbyshire, 30th Cambridgeshire, etc. Try to press across the river as the, as the fire changes to, to, to shrapnel. And then on the bank of the river, whilst the troops are reorganizing on the south bank, they splash across weapons above the head, trying to keep them dry, trying to keep their ammunition dry as they get across the other side of the river. The order goes up, right, reorganize yourselves on the south bank of the armor. Trouble is, the south bank of the armor is now directly under fire from the 32 pound gun howitzers, which are firing from the Great Redoubt and from the Lesser Redoubt, which is the British looks in about 600, 700 paces off to the left. This is an absolute total killing ground. The sevenths are swept by artillery fire. They also find themselves facing the Kazan Regiment, the 32nd or Kazan Regiment, <coughs> excuse me, who are firing hard into their flank halfway up the Alma. Morgan, he's a grenadier company uh, officer. He has no reason, no reason at all to be around the colours, none. But the colours are being shot down right in the middle, right in the middle of the, of, of the regiment. The colours are constantly falling. The young subalterns who are trying to carry them are being wounded or killed. Eventually, Morgan is told by Major Hume. Now, Major Hume is the junior major. We've got the commanding officer, the senior major, and the junior major. The junior major, <coughs> James Hume. He comes pushing through the smoke from the burning village, which I've just described. Gets hold of Morgan, who's a he's a big man, he's sort of five foot eleven, something like that, and says, Right, get yourself down, get hold of the regimental colour. Morgan looks at him and he notices that Hume, that's Hume's, that's Hume's epaulet, which you can see, that's the badge of rank of a of a major at the time. Well, he notices that Hume's epaulet has already got a bullet hole through it. He notices that his haversack, Hume's haversack, has got a great gash in the side and his razor and other bits and personal equipment are sticking out of the side of this haversack. He's got a blinking gunshot hole here through his epaulette. And Hume, he's got no headdress, he's had his head hat shot off, his cap shot off. He says, right, Morgan, get yourself up, get hold of the colours. But, 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 I'm a grenadier. No, do as you're told. So up he goes. And of course, there he is. He's, he's 500 paces now from a 32, from a, from a battery of 32 pound gun howitzers, looking straight into the muzzles of these things, which are firing down a pre prepared slope right into his gut. Well, he takes the colour and thinks, according to his diary, I, I probably won't see tomorrow. I probably won't see tomorrow, but I must show front. I must show for use that phrase later on. Otherwise, I've got to do my duty. Now, as they're coming up the slope, <clears throat> a Russian rifleman carrying one of these things. Morgan can see the Russian rifleman. He's about probably about 200 yards to his front. And he sees a puff of smoke and he feels a catch to his side. And if you look on the uniform up here, the right hand wing, so he's a grenadier, the right hand wing is missing. The reason it's missing is it gets shot away at the armor. And Morgan sees that the rifleman is reloading. He's probably, I say, 200 paces from him, and he sees him reloading. So he said to Keenan, Private Keenan, who is next to him, right, you, you take the color, he hands the color to a private soldier, give me a rifle. Now clearly the officers are not carrying rifles. And Keenan said, well, yeah, all right, sir. Um, passes in the weapon, Morgan, who is a very, very keen, very keen shot, just the sights very carefully, lines himself up against the Russian rifleman, cocks the weapon, bang, fires the weapon, and he says, he sees the Russian rifleman fall like a shot pheasant. Now, regimental folklore has it that he passes the back, passes the rifle back to Keenan, to which Keenan says, now clean the bugger, sir. Um, now, whether he actually does or not, we, we're probably not quite in the action, but he takes the colour and up they go, up the slope. Uh, <clears throat> Hume behind him, smoke covering the, flank, the, 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 the slope, the guns firing immediately in front. We don't know how many rounds the Russians fire, but as they're going up the slope, so over to the, to the left, 
the Green Howards, the 19th, the 23rd Royal Welsh Fusiliers, the 33rd, first, first Yorkshire West Riding, later the Duke of Wellington's Regiment, 95th the Derbyshire Regiment, they plunge into the battery. They charge it simply, simple as that. As, as Carmichael, who's the other Grenadier Company subaltern of the 95th, says, we haven't even fixed banners. This has been such a chaotic advance, but somehow just grit and courage. The boys are in to the redoubt, and the Russians, seeing the advancing British, immediately limber up their guns. They use what they call a lasso harness, which is self-explanatory. It's just a strip of rope, which you can use a couple of, couple of horses to get the gun out of its position before the rest of the team comes up to carry the guns away. We think that, the, well, we know, the vast majority of guns are actually physically taken out of the redoubt. There are two that are left. One is closed with by a Captain Bell of the 23rd Regiment, who has a revolver. Now, this is the old-fashioned revolver with six revolving barrels rather than a, a revolving chamber. It's called a pepper pot. Many of you all know it. He goes up to the, the chap, one of the, the Russian, that's trying to drag the gun away, one of the riders, and he fires all six barrels, all six barrels. The first one misses, and the five others all misfire. Now, those of you that are familiar with 19th century muzzle-loading firearms, that's not that unusual. But this poor man, he's only, he's only feet away from Bell. And Bell goes up to him, reverses the pistol, and then beats him over the head with him, calling him a coward. Now, he's, not, he's many things, but he's not a coward. He's faced this blinking weapon, misfiring five times, fired once. Bell dashes the Russian driver off the horse, manages to get hold of the gun and physically grabs the damn thing. Captain Hayland from the 95th is next. He's off to one side. He's the man, if you remember, who said, well, if I'm going to lose anything, I would rather not lose a leg. Sorry, I'd rather not lose an arm. I do beg your pardon. This is the conversation the night before. Well, predictably, of course, the last discharge of shot from the guns before the redcoats get onto the position Hayland has his left arm. It's not actually shot off, but it's been hanging there by a few tendons, bleeding heavily. Hayland has enough courage, enough guts, enough, I don't, know, I don't know what he's working on by this stage, but he takes his sword, grabs the thing by the point and carves onto the side of the carriage of the gun, the number 95. He's got the gun. The two guns captured. British pour in. And then suddenly, 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 uh, the, the, the Russian Kazan regiment counterattacks. It, it's a very, very, very well conducted counterattack. They come pouring down the slope, Bennett's level, and the cry goes up. So you can imagine the British are now on the other side of, of a redoubt. So, so they haven't got sandbags between them. They're now, they're now sandbags behind them with the Russians pushing down, looking straight into their faces. And the cry goes up, Fusiliers retire. What this is about is never, is never clear. If the British had stood and fought, and if, if they poured volleys into the, into the approaching Kazan regiment, they'd probably have been all right. They might have crossed bayonets with them. But I suppose it's that point where courage is exhausted, short-term courage is exhausted. Well, troops pour back down. They pull back down from the position that they've just, just adopted. Now, luckily, coming through the stream are reinforcements. The stream uh, through, through the Alma, so about 600 paces down to, to, to the north of them. Through the stream, pushing through the river, come the Brigade of Guards. 3rd Battalion of the Grenadier Guards, 2nd Battalion of the Scots Fusilier Guards, 2nd Battalion of the Coldstream Guards, as they come through. Now, and the Scots Fusilier Guards come forward in a bit of a mess. They're not properly organized. And as they come forward, <clears throat> their color party meets the attacking, the attacking Russians. Two of their officers are bayoneted. One is, one's bayoneted to death on the spot. Lord Balgoni, who is the second uh, ensign, he dies of his wounds when he gets to Turkey. But nonetheless, I, I think it's fairly clear that if you're, if you're stabbing people, then you're, the, the counterattack is working extremely well. Scots Fusilier Guards go reeling back, reeling back to the, to the Alma, <clears throat> immediately below them. As the Grenadiers and the Coldstream are coming out 
of the stream. And the cry goes up from the grenadier in the cold stream. Who are the queen's favourites now? <laughs> Damn your eyes. Who are the queen's favourites? Well, that's enough. That's enough to rally the Scots Fusilier Guards. It's bad enough being stabbed by Russians, but being laughed at by English regiments. Well, there we are. You know, there's nothing. There's no greater in indignity for a Scotsman. Not that they're Scots, but they got the title of Scots. <laughs> Grenadiers on the right, Scots Fusilier Guards in the middle, Coldstream Guards on the left deliver actually a magnificent counter counterattack. These, these three regiments go back up the hill, which is now covered in British redcoats from the early attack that I have just discussed with you. But, but off to the flank is our man, James Hume, with his shot, shot filled epaulette. And he gets the colour party of the 95th. He's a major, so he's quite a senior boy. And he approaches the young subaltern, the right hand subaltern of the 3rd Battalion of the Grenadier Guards and says, may I have your leave to fall in my colour party, sir, please. Now, this is all sort of military nonsense. There's a bit of nicety that's going on because a formed brigade of guardsmen, is a line regiment is approaching it and therefore they're asking if their tattered shot at colour party can join the guards advance. Well, I can only imagine the guards suddenly says, oh, yeah, all right, if you like. Um, and so James Hume, and Anthony Morgan, a chap called um, uh, Carmichael, they form up again with the colours on the right-hand side of the Grenadier Guards. And these three regiments of guards, plus a little knot of 95th, advance back up the hill. They have paused. They, 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 they fire on the move. Again, it's not something that can be done that easily, but they fire on the move. And the guards pause, and they fix bayonets just before. They, they do the final assault onto the Great Redoubt. Finally, three and a bit regiments of guardsmen swamp, storm into the Redoubt. There are only two guns left there now. They're, they're not facing the artillery that they were beforehand. Those two guns are out of action as described. But nonetheless, it's a very, very considerable achievement. And the Great Redoubt falls, and then really as an afternote, in officers left come the three battalions of the Highland Brigade under Colin Campbell, uh, Brigadier General Colin Campbell. 42nd, 79th and 93rd Highland Regiments, Black Watch and all that gang. They come in volleying and firing and no doubt playing their pipes and wearing their skirts and all this good stuff. They come in and the, the central part of the Russian position is taken. Their artillery has dispersed. Their infantry is on the run. The French guns, now on the British right, so on the Russian left, are now playing on the retiring Russians. <coughs> and the British light cavalry are brought up, cross the armour, and start to threaten the flank of the Russians who are now looking south towards Sevastopol and running as hard as they possibly can off the armour position. And they, they failed to dig in any other reserve positions down to the south above Sebastopol. Now, the battle's pretty well won, but the opportunity now comes, of course, to turn a defeat into a rout. I can't explain this. Lord Raglan, the British commander, has fought in, I think he's probably fought in 16 major actions as a younger officer. He's lost his arm at Waterloo. Okay. He's, he's, our, he's our age, he's an old bugger like us. But nonetheless, nonetheless, he should know better. He should know better now. Now's the time to chase your enemy. Now's the time to unleash your horse artillery. Now's the time to unleash your cavalry regiments to chase the Russians and follow up. And, and if necessary, if possible, to bounce Sevastopol, which is further down to the south. He doesn't, he pauses, he licks his wounds. It's extraordinary, quite extraordinary. <coughs> um, the diaries now, now talk endlessly about what has just happened. Um, probably the most revealing of all is from an officer called Neville of the Grenadier Guards, 3rd Battalion of the Grenadier Guards, who says that he, he, he came to the Crimea expecting falling games. He expected to be in Sevastopol in no time at all. But he says the, the 
Um, and I've seen my friends cast into oblivion. I've seen them torn limb from limb by the enemy shot. This isn't life. This is hell. This is hell. I never want to see anything like it again. The, the two brothers from the 95th Regiment, um, they're called Luff. Their surname is Luff. Frank Luff is with James Luff. James Luff, um, they're in different companies. Frank Luff goes over to find James Luff, who is lying pierced by shot. And he just has time to, before he's ordered back into line to carry on just to cut a, cut a bit of a lock of hair from his brother. To, uh, and he takes the lock of hair and he puts a little bit of string around it and tucks it inside his tunic with a view to sending it his back, back to his mother, who lives on Healing Island. Unfortunately, Frank Luff, so the one that's done the cutting of the hair with his brother's hair, he's killed at Inkerman. And I don't imagine that lock of hair ever gets back to his mother. Have 5,000, there or thereabouts, um, killed and injured in this particular, this first battle of the Crimean campaign. The British, it's never properly established, but the British lose about 2,000, about 2,000 killed and injured. Maybe a remarkably high number of men who are killed. <clears throat> There's probably 1,000 British bodies lying on the Alma to this day. French slightly less, something like a thousand, and the Turks uh, a couple of hundred. It's a stunning victory for the Allies. It's an extraordinary victory for the Allies. The Russians should never have lost the position, but but they don't follow up. They don't follow up quickly, and when they do follow up, they find that Sevastopol has now been properly defended and is going to have to be besieged. As a result of the victory at the Alma. As a result of not following up quickly enough, the British siege lines move in to the south of Sevastopol, which I'll describe next time. And that occasions the Battle of Balaclava on the 25th of October. The attempt, the Russian reconnaissance on the 26th of October, and then the Great Battle of Inkerman on the 5th of November, when so many men, <coughs> excuse me, who have managed to avoid getting themselves killed or wounded at the Alma, actually meet their maker in one of the most savage and bloody battles, not just of the Crimean campaign, but really throughout the 19th century.